Welcome everyone to the Cleverly Changing Podcast. I am super, super excited about today's guest. There is a special guest on our call today. This podcast has been going since 2019 and ever so often I have someone that has been a dream guest and Brandy Riley is one of those dream guests that I am so excited to introduce to all of you. Brandy, welcome to the Cleverly Changing Podcast. Can you tell everybody just a little bit about who you are? Yes, thank you. Oh, that was a nice welcome. I appreciate that. <laughs> so I am Brandy Riley. I am a Northern California mom of two kids. I have a middle schooler who's about to graduate and go to high schooler, and I have a kindergartner. Um, my husband and I are both educators. We met um, years ago at an education conference, and since then, I have transitioned into tech. Um, while being a part of tech and being in like the creator industry, I still am really interested in education and all of my work has kind of been you know, like planted in that. Um, and so now I have a new venture where I'm going back to my purely educational roots, where I am researching and designing and building and creating products for families um, centered around black history. So I am a history lover. I'm a, like, I love documentaries and I love reading history books. I even love historical fiction. <laughs> so like, this is a perfect fit for me. And I'm just, I'm happy to be here and share it with your audience. And just my journey to getting back to where I was when I first started my career 20 years ago. Awesome. So everybody, I know I said Brandy was a dream guest. She introduced herself and she told you about her wonderful family, but let me tell you how Brandy and I connected. <laughs> so I feel like I started blogging maybe 12 years ago. And so if you're listening to the podcast, before I started podcasting and sharing my homeschool journey, I started with a blog. My kids were only two. I was nursing and I needed an outlet. And there were a couple, there were a handful of identifiable Black moms who were also online sharing their stories and sharing their experiences. And that is how Brandy and I connected. I remember through Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> I remember connecting with Brandy through Twitter. And then a few years later, a friend of mine um, that was local told me about Brandy's group. She had a group at the time. It was an online Facebook group where different moms all across the nation were connecting and talking about their experiences. And the group was called Courage to Earn. And I know that many of you have heard about bloggers making money, but frankly, many of us were writing and were not making money. And Brandy yeah. was really one of those people who said, hey, I've had the privilege to have the inside scoop. I've been behind the scenes hiring people who are bloggers. Let me, excuse me, let me share a few tips with you about the industry and how you can be successful and earn money. And so what I loved is Brandy could have kept all of that information to herself, but she wanted to share her knowledge to build a community and connect yeah. others. And that's exactly what she did. And so I had the honor of being one of the moms in the groups and it just, it gave me um, more courage, just like yeah. the name says, yeah. to set my rates and own my value as a writer as a speaker and edu as an educator. And so I just wanted to say thank you to Brandy because she did that for a lot of women, not just me. And so it's one of the ways that I'm able to podcast with you today because I had that courage, which, um, you know, to diversify. Don't yeah. just have one stream of income, have several. And so um, this is truly an honor. And I know it's Black History Month, so we didn't just come to talk about our <laughs> early history but here's the thing as black women and as um, historians because yeah. we're going to take ownership of that mm -hmm. as historians we had the i guess commonality to teach our children not just our history of slavery mm -hmm. but as 
owners, as overcomers, as kings and queens, as yeah. people who are educated, who are valuable and who are worthy. And so Brandy has taken that experience to a whole new level. And so Brandy, I, I want you to tell everybody just a little bit about why this was so important to you. Did you have, you know, a blog post that went viral for Black History Month and in the back of your mind, you said, hmm, I can take this a step further. Like what was yeah. kind of the catalyst that caused you to write the book? Yeah, that was, that's actually part of it. So um, I also have a blog, Mama Knows It All, and I've been blogging for, actually, it's kind of the same story. You know, my daughter was about to be one years old, and literally, I started the blog the night before her first birthday, and um, she'll be 14 in May. So the blog is 13 years old, and every year I do, I get you know, a lot of traffic to my Black History posts, Black History book posts, um, books featuring Black kids, Martin Luther King posts. And, you know, I, I even wrote a script for folks, you know, how to talk to my kids about Black History Month, a specific script, this is what to say. Um, because just like you said, you know, our history is more than just slavery or trials and tribulations. And I think a lot of times when it comes to non-Black folks, when they think about Black history, they think about we shall overcome, but they don't necessarily talk about the stuff that we overcame or the stuff that we brought with us, <laughs> the stuff that we built once we got here. So, you know, and thinking about that and, you know, a lot of the comments that I would get would be, you know, how do I talk to my kids about Black history when I don't really want to talk about violence or how do I do it in a way that's gentle? I'm like, what are you talking about? You talk about pilgrims during Thanksgiving and Black folks were pioneers at the very beginning of, you know, the creation of the United States. Um, you talk about, you know, white artists or even European artists, Picasso and all of those folks, there are hundreds, thousands of, you know, Black artists who have been here, who have been making art, who have been adding color, color to our world and like contributing to the culture of, of, of contributing to American culture. Um, and so, and thinking about that, and then just being someone who loves to relax. I'm a relaxer now. <laughs> like over the last few years, I've turned into someone who likes to relax. So I do everything from watercolor to puzzles and word searches. And one of the things that I found with my word searches that I thought was really interesting is there are word searches for everything. There are activity books for everything from like civil war and revolutionary war. There are people who are like really engaged in topics and they will find anything that has that topic. Um, but what I didn't find was a lot of Black history puzzles and activities that were kid-friendly, that were focused on the things that we don't hear about, building towns, you know, um, inventing things that we never knew were invented by Black people. You know, I'm always still kind of blown away by people who didn't know the super soaker was invented by a Black man. You know, people are still learning that every single day. And this is not like an old invention. It's not like the hot home or elevator doors, which by the way, elevator doors were invented by someone black as well. Um, you know, the opening and closing, the um, the uh, automatic opening and closing was invented by someone black, but you know, we don't, we don't hear about that. And thinking about my own children who go to um, a parochial school and it's diverse, but even when you're going to a diverse school or newly diverse school, there's still going to be pockets of information that kids, I think, just aren't getting. You know, they're still getting this very surface Black history. I'm okay. We love him. Rosa Parks, love her, you know, but there's more to our existence in this country than just those two amazing you know, leaders, activists, there's, there are people who aren't activists, you know, there's a lot of black people who contributed who weren't necessarily in politics, who weren't necessarily in the church, you know, but every single aspect of American culture has been touched by black people. And I wanted my kids and your kids and everybody's kids to understand that. And the thing about, um, 
this business, which is um, creating activity books for uh, for children, not just black children, any child, is that it just it's a spark. So that's the name of the business, Black History Spark. It's just to spark the information, you know, just like with every other topic in culture, you know, you don't have to beat kids over the head with information in order for them to absorb it, you know, just make it a natural part of their environment. Alma Johnson, Look you know, up, up they see a book at the library that has her name on it. And now they want to, you know, take it and pick it up and try it out. So that's why I created it because I just feel like our kids deserve Black history being normalized and integrated into our regular everyday lives. All right. So you used a couple words that I want to unpack. And the first word is activist. Yeah. And knowing you, I know that you are a digital activist and it's something that you value in your interactions with all people. Sometimes we as Black women um, may shy away from the activism side that is within us because yeah. we don't want to be seen as the angry Black woman. But you've kind of flipped that narrative. Can you really just unpack why activism is important and it has nothing to do with that angry Black woman trope. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I think about my life as a woman and the things that I went through and, you know, even as someone who is neurodivergent and who has children who are neurodivergent, you know, and I think about, you know, if folks before me had been more outspoken or if they or if they had the words to be able to say if they knew what to say if they knew what to do if they were able to take actions to improve conditions at work at school in the community to make you know a lot of our situations easier then i could i i could have went without a whole lot of trouble you know so i think we are we owe it to ourselves and our future generations to speak up for ourselves i think that for so long, activism has been kind of put into a box of you're, you're loud. To be an activist, you have to be loud. You have to be outspoken. You have to be, you know, angry. But that's not the case. I mean, activism is what I'm doing with these books. Here is another alternative. Here is what we need is information. And here is information. Now, I'm not standing on a pedestal or, or at a podium giving a speech, but I'm providing a tool and sharing resources that's going to help improve the way that we're depicted, you know, in life and in society later on down the line. My kids won't have to say, you know, do some of the things that I had to talk about when I was in middle school where people were like, well, Black people were just slaves. <laughs> you know, like, I heard that. I heard that in middle school. Like, well, Black people didn't do anything or Black people are lazy. And it's like, no, instead of arguing with fools, which I choose not to do, I can offer an alternative and say, okay, well, that's your opinion. But here are, here's a book with 500 facts that prove otherwise check it out. <laughs> and I think that right now, where we are in society and what we've been through over the last few years, especially Black women with, you know, standing on the front lines of, um, of protest and online and offline, you know, just being the people always at the front. Um, I think that we owe it to ourselves to be gentle activists now, you know, and to think about like, how can I act? How can I be an activist for myself and for my own needs and start thinking about that. You know, we're always looking at other people and how can we support them? How can I be there for them? But I think it's time for us to take a step back and say, what can I do to make life easier for myself? So even with these history books, you know, my kids, again, they go to a school that is kind of newly diverse, you know, since my daughter's been there for nine years, it's, it's gone up and we've had a lot to do with that. My husband's on the diversity committee and you know, we talk to people, we talk to a lot of people and encourage them to come to our school. But, you know, at the same time, being able to have this, have an easy tool to give out to all the kids in the class to take home with them, you know, that just makes life easier for me. It makes life easier for my kids. And I'm just looking for, you know, the least resistance possible to get my point across. <laughs> wow. So, I'm going to put a pin right here. 
I want you to define neurodivergent just in case, because I know that may be a new term for some, and yeah. I don't want them to just get, get caught up in that term. So <laughs> please yeah. define Oh, that's, it. A, that's really good. Yeah. So neurodivergent is someone who um, has a different way of thinking. Their mind behaves differently. So I have ADHD and I suffer from anxiety. My daughter has ADHD um, and my son, I'm not sure, but um, he's very, very sensitive, you know, um, and so we haven't had him tested, but I just treat him. Um, I treat him like who he is, which is, you know, James, <laughs> but you know, there's, it's not like my kids, you can't just put them in a room with a hundred people and without any preparation and they're able to adjust. They just need a little bit more support. So that's what I mean by neurodivergent. Thank you so much. You know, what you're describing in the term of activism and why you wrote the book and you're sharing the 500 facts is very important at this time because we have in the local news many stories about banned books yeah. about african-american history not being important and you know the timeliness of this is just so paramount right now is there something that you feel all parents should recognize about the need for teaching their children about America's full history? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the thing about truth is that it is so freeing, you know, and so many people in our country are still in bondage, not just Black folks. You know, there are hundreds of thousands of poor white people, you know, poor Asians, like folks who are just struggling in our country. And a big part of that is that we are not honest just in general. You know, we're just not honest about like, where's the money going? What do you really need to get a job? What does it really take to buy a house? And I think that the easiest thing to start with is our history. That's already happened. You know, we can change what we do in the future, but we can't change what happened in the past. So like, let's just be honest about what happened so that we can start finding answers for all of these questions that we have about, you know, why is it still so difficult for Black folks to buy homes in certain communities? You know, let's talk about the fact that because they couldn't buy 50 years ago when the prices were affordable, and those houses were passed down to generation to generation. That's why at 35, you can't afford to buy the house next door to your high school, your white high school classmate, you know, but we're not really going to come to, but we have all these organizations that are trying to help, but without being honest about like our history and where we actually came from those, like, we're never going to see the success that we're, that we're aiming for. So I think right now is the perfect time to start with black history. You know, like it happened, it's true, it's real, but the full history. And I think that that's part of the issue is that when we think about, again, when we see black history very often, it's focused on the trials and tribulations, as opposed to imagine coming out with just talking about black folks creating towns or how they were, you know, there were 50 to a hundred barbers in, you know, one square foot of, you know, of Memphis at one point, you know, and they were the ones doing hair for everybody, for the white men, for the black men, for everybody. You know, we talk about, you know, what it took for black folks to vote, but then talking about, yeah, even though it took a long time there before, you know, the laws changed, there were black folks voting in the 1800s. So let's, you know, go back to the very beginning and share real information. And then it makes like the trials and tribulations seem less of a dividing factor between black and white folks. And I think that that's, that's a big issue, you know, is that white people get scared when they see us talking about those trials and tribulations. And I think we could do a better job of balancing it with sharing and also Y'all owe us credit for building this, for making this, for working alongside you with this, for bringing you these industries, rice, cotton, <laughs> you know, all these things that we brought to you guys. So yeah, I think now is a really good time for that, especially with this critical race theory, which by the way, I mean, I think, you know, and everybody already knows like CRT is not what folks make it out to be. And it's definitely nothing that elementary or middle school students would be um 
engaged with. <laughs> so I think that conversation is just so crazy that folks are having. But, you know, there is an alternative. And that is, you know, the books that I create, the books that you make, you know, the books that there are plenty of Black authors out there, you know, creating alternatives to this scary history. I'm doing air quotes, y'all. Scary history that people think um, they have to share when they're talking to kids about Black history. Wow. You know, when I think about Dr. Martin Luther King, he didn't only march for Black people. Right. There was, you know, the poor man's campaign mm -hmm. and a lot of what he did dealt with the economics of American yep. history. And that's something that you touched on. I feel as a parent that history is so important, which is one of the reasons why I started this podcast, because we owe it to our future generations. Yeah. Whatever we teach our children, it builds upon that foundation yep. that was given to them before. All lessons have a beginning, they have basics. And even our history, it has a basic foundation. And for us to be truthful, for us to grow, for us to really want our children to level up, we say these catchphrases, but, but in order to do that, we have to give them a strong, truthful yeah. foundation. Yeah. And by sharing history, we can do that. So I am a writer, like you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. I have an activity book. My my book, uh, my activity book is about sickle cell. And like you, I used a subject that can be kind of like a hard subject yeah. that's heavy. Mm -hmm. And I believe that children could learn through play. In writing your book, what are some of the things that really got you excited? Because as you write, when it's something you're passionate about, you can find yourself smiling and just there's there's some sort of euphoria that takes yeah. place inside of you. Can you describe your experience? Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm telling you, I just felt so empowered. You know, there's, you can't help it, you know, doing research for, there's, um, so the first book I wrote is Black History Across the United States for, so for every state, 50 states, there's a, a word search puzzle um, with 12 uh, words, and then each of those words has a definition. And so just going through that, researching that book and looking at, wow, I did not know this about Black folks in Idaho. <laughs> like we've really been everywhere. <laughs> we really have done everything. So that was that first that really got me hyped, you know, and my initial plan was to create this book and to really just spend time marketing and promoting and going out and sharing it with people. But I was so pumped. I was like, you know, I want to go deeper with some of these people that I met in doing the research of the book. So, um, you know, so people from uh, from Washington, people from California, I wanted to go a little deeper. So I also have three books, Meet the Black Greats. One is um, Black Creatives, Black Innovators, which is Scientists and Inventors, and Black Movers and Shakers, which is Athletes. So in going through the Creatives one, because I'm a creator, you know, and doing research on all of these artists, I mentioned Alma, the artist Alma Johnson before, um, with her, I, I read that she was a teacher in Washington, D.C., all the way up until she was in her 70s. She was Then she retired, and that's when she really went full-fledged into her art career. She had her first big uh, exhibit in her 70s. And that, to me, just gave me the motivation to, like, it's not too late. There's always time while we are such a, you know, consistent, resilient people. And it just, like, I felt buoyed. I felt I felt proud, you know, like these are my people. This is what I come from. So I felt um, the entire process was exciting, you know, and even with the design, you know, so I'm not a designer by trade. I have always said, I'm not good with, you know, like I'm not good with dimensions and my eyesight is a little off, <laughs> you know, but spending time, just putting my heart into it. I wanted to create the covers. I wanted to design the interiors because I wanted people to know I put my heart and soul into it. And with each um, researched fact, 
it just gave me more energy to keep going and keep going and keep going. This was a month long process, obviously, to get these books created and to go to the library on the weekends and pulling out big, you know, big books and going through them and trying to make sure I have the information, the facts correct. But it was worth it for the, the energy that it gave me um, and the pride that I felt. It was just it was just an amazing experience. I get so much from, from making these books and just from remembering how great we are. Yes, we were kings and queens, but we don't even have to go back that far. Like we are still doing it. <laughs> We've been doing it. Absolutely. I love it. I, I'm wondering, do you have a favorite activity in your book? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so one of the things that I did with my books is I created, um, uh, people can also get uh, flashcards. So I love doing that with my kids, you know, um, and you, you're a homeschool mom, so your kids probably no flashcards a lot, but you know, it's just a fun game to like say, okay, who is this? And then have my kids tell me back like who that person is. So I really enjoy that. That's more of like an interactive thing um, that folks can do with these books. I mean, they're meant to be independent play, but also, you know, I'm hoping that kids will take the books to their parents and say, mom, can you quiz me? You know, can you test me for this person? So yeah, that's, that's probably my favorite part. Oh, wow. It sounds so fantastic. I know that you put a lot of heart and soul in what you do. Have you thought about any pushback that you may receive? And if so, what will be kind of your rebuttal to it? Yeah, you know, I haven't thought about any pushback. I haven't received any. Um, but if I get it, uh, I think I said earlier, you know, my my thing is rest and peace. So I will just delete it, ignore it, remove it. <laughs> and if somebody says it in my face, I will just walk away. Because like you said, truth is truth. It is what it is. You know, these are well-researched facts. I went to my public library. You know, I have a library full of books in our home. So take it up with all of these authors, all of these historians, John Hope Franklin <laughs> from Duke University. You know, like you can. So you just shared about your books. You mentioned three of them. How many are in this series? Right now, there are five books in the series, and I have um, a little kid's book. I've, people have been asking me about a little kid's book. Um, so I'm, I have a little kid's book that'll come out February 15th. Um, but now I'm going to kind of slow things down. So there are, you know, there'll be six books total in the series. And then I have a book coming out for the summer, and then we'll move on from there. So yeah, there's a, there's a good amount of books, a good amount of information to get people started. Can you give us the name of each book? I'm building up everybody because I know you're like, they keep talking about these books. Yes, <laughs> yes. You know, and I want to tell you, I will put um, a link in the show notes page. And hopefully I can have a picture of Brandy on the show notes page with her book so that yeah. you can see the books. I think that's always helpful for people. And you talked about... Um, you know, your process. So say the names. And then my next question for you is to tell us, um, you know, why you decided to self-publish. So yeah. Oh, I'm glad you asked that because I want to, I definitely want to talk to the parents about self-publishing. Um, so the books are Black History Across the United States. Uh, so that features, uh, you know, 50 states, one puzzle for each state and then resource pages for each state. Um, I have the Meet the Great series, which is um, Black creatives, Black movers and shakers, and Black innovators. Um, and then I have Black History for Little Kids that'll be coming out uh, in a few weeks. So yeah, I'm really excited about those. In terms of self-publishing, you know, I like to be in control of, um, of, of distribution, honestly, you know, I want this information to be able to get out to people. I want to be able, if people can't afford it, to give them a PDF. You know, if they have a school group and they are like, I really want to do this with my kids, but we just can't afford it. I want to be able to give them a PDF and say, hey, make photocopies for your class. That's totally fine. I want to be able to sell them wherever I want and whenever I want. Uh, and then if I have a good idea and I'm able to push through and get a book done in two months, I don't want to have to wait for a publisher to tell me, 
okay, so next year we'll get this out. You know, um, I have published traditionally with publishers and actually my last book, the publishing company, after I'd already done the first draft, the publishing company came back and said, we don't have funding for this book anymore. So, you know, they paid me a fee <clears throat> and then my book was done. So when you are you know, publishing with a publishing house, you are under their rules, under their dates and under their information. Um, but with this, I knew that I wanted to have full control over it. So in terms of self-publishing as parents, I just think it's a great, in addition to having control over like the creative process and what it is that you want to share with folks, you also have like control over the design, control over distribution. It's a great side hustle or for somebody who has the time to make it a full-time gig. There are so many people out there who are looking for information um, about everything. And if you have the knowledge and you've been wanting to write a book, there's no excuse for it now that you can go to Amazon or Ingram Sparks. These are self-publishing platforms um, and publish your own book. Just get it out there. Start, you know, we want to share truth. You want to share your story, get it out there. The gatekeepers are gone. That's gone. <laughs> yes. That's what I like to think of mm -hmm. when I think about the way that we publish today. Yeah. And I love that you talked about the control because I think for me, um, I have some friends who are like, oh, you're you're an excellent writer. You should, you know, publish traditionally. I don't understand why you haven't gotten a deal yet. And I'm quite content yeah. self-publishing mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. of that control and I know that what I'm doing, I can, like if I wanna do a licensing deal, yeah. if I want to gift things, just like you talked about, yeah. you can do that. If I need yep. to change something, because sometimes mm -hmm. you'll find something along the way and you're like, oh, I need to tweak this. By self-publishing, you can do all of that yourself. Yep. And so I think it's kind of something that unlocks a door. Once you get that first book out, it's like the possibilities are endless. Yeah. Now, this is a podcast where families often um, listen with their kids. Have Has your daughter published books too? Because I know that once we have this gift and yeah. we've opened that door, we often want to bring other people along. So yes. Yes. So my daughter hasn't published any books yet, but she has definitely helped me with every single book that I've done. I mean, she helps with my blog. She is an amazing writer. She's, you know, she's a, what is it? Gen Z, Gen X. I can't remember, you know, Z. but they have like Gen Z, you know, they're really good with like editing and just being creative. And so she will tell me, mommy, that doesn't look good. Let's switch this up. Or she'll say, let me just see it, mommy, just give it to me. <laughs> I'll fix it. So she has definitely helped. She, um, she's more into fiction writing. So she's working on some short stories. So she will be published soon. I have no doubt about that. Awesome. Awesome. I know I've been trying to get my girls to publish some books because one of them is more of a artist and the oh, other yeah. one does like writing fictional stories, but they're just like, mom, you know, they're just not at, there's not a fire under them. Like, like it is me. I don't know. I think after yeah. 2020, I felt like I was losing time. So it's yeah. like, I have to get all of these things out. And so I feel like I'm on a, a treadmill and I'm running this mm -hmm. race, um, but it's a little different for Gen Z. They're like, I'll yeah. do it when I'm ready. <laughs> Yeah, that's it. That's it. And that's what my daughter says. She's like, well, when I'm in high school, I'll do X, Y, Z. I'm like, okay. I'm like, I have this idea. I need to do this right now. <laughs> yes, yes. It has been truly a pleasure. I know I could talk to you all day because I feel like we're we're kindred spirits in sure. our desire to educate others and our love for people. I think what some people fail to realize is when you write a book, when you share things with the world, 
you're doing it because you you love them like yeah. it is an act of service yeah. to share your knowledge to share your expertise and to take time to wrap it up in a beautiful book yeah. and, and share it with people it is it is a labor of love whether you're self-publishing or traditional traditionally publishing and so i love that you've taken ownership of all of your gifts and you've been able to do that and still you know you're not afraid to come up with something new because i feel like sometimes people are like man you're doing too much yeah. because you mm -hmm. have your hands in so many places right. but i feel like you often have your hands in a lot of places but you're completely fine with that and you say you know it is it is a gift and yeah. you're honored to do that it's not something you know i i call my blog and this podcast cleverly changing because the one thing about parenting is that it will always change always. there will never be anything that's stagnant and mm -hmm. i know that me um, my favorite Bible verse is to whomsoever much is given, much is required. And I feel like I have a lot of gifts. I have a lot of expertise and a lot of talents. And because I've been given and entrusted yeah. with so much, I have to find that a way to share that with people. And I feel like, you know, this is where you and I are alike. And so I love that you took the time today to share your expertise with us. And I want everybody to know how they can connect with you, how they can get your books and how they can follow your journey. Yeah. Yeah. Um, blackhistoryspark.com. Um, if you go there, follow me at black history spark on Instagram. You can follow me on Br at Brandy Jeter, J E T E R on Instagram. Quite frankly, I'm not on there a whole lot, um, anymore just because, uh, social media is different. So I'm not quite on there a lot, but if you go to Black History Spark, if you email me, I love that. Um, and I do send out newsletters that are really engaging and um, people respond back and we kind of have like a pen pal relationship. So definitely reach out to me. Let's connect for sure. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I know everybody is just fired up just as much as I am. And I just hit publish on a new parenting book. And so I want to say, I want to just tell everybody this. My very first book that I wrote, it took me six years to publish it. I joined Brandy's group, um, like I mentioned earlier. And Brandy said, you know, you should do a coloring book. <laughs> And so the very first book that I self-published was a coloring book. And yeah. it was with your advice, I have sold over 3,000 wow. coloring books. So I know that what you're doing, it encouraged me and it's going to encourage so many other people. And these books, you know, when you hear people like DeSanta saying African-American history isn't important, that is so untrue. And yeah. if you question why it's untrue, I challenge you to get Brandy's books yeah. and really begin to unlock the opportunities of knowledge and to really find out what beautiful gifts people who are ha who have a diverse legacy what gifts they bring to the world, not just to America, but to the world at large because although you're writing about Americans, you're writing about greats. It's really our contributions yeah. are worldwide. For and sure. so I want to say thank you from one mom to another. Thanks so yes, much. Yes, thank you. Thank you. This is my first press, you guys. So I'm super pumped to be here with Cleverly Changing, one of my faves forever. So thank you. <laughs> well, thank you so much. And everybody definitely support, get the book for yourself, get the book for a friend. These make great classroom gifts. So if they you do. are listening yeah. and you're a parent who supplements your child's education, these are gifts you want to give to, to your child's school, to their classrooms yeah. and buy several, you know, we want better 
for the next generation. For the sure. only way that we're going to set them up right is to give them this knowledge. So thank you, Brandy, for really just kind of um, providing a framework for us to use to teach our children. For the five books that you have currently out, what is the age range, age range that you recommend for those books? Yeah, so for the um, for the first four, I would say um, middle grades. So fifth grade on up, adults enjoy it too. Um, and then for the little kids book, that'll be, um, I would say preschool up through first grade. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. So everybody, you heard from Brandy right here on the Cleverly Changing podcast. Please continue support to support, get the books, share the books, and just let us know if you have new ideas. Send Brandy that email, yeah. connect with her, connect with others, let people know that you're listening and supporting and you're appreciating what they're doing. So thank you all for listening and bye for now.